a conversation between a printing company employee and a customer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matrix Printing. I'm John Smith. How can I help you? Good afternoon. I'm here to reprint a brochure for our hotel. There are some pages that need revising. Sure. How may I address you? Oh, I'm Mary Jane from Central Hotel Chains. Nice to meet you. I've got samples of the previous version. I assume it is your company's advertising brochure? Yes. What exactly is the problem? Well, it was printed the year before, so some of the information is already out of date. There are also a couple of problems with the layout. Firstly, the letters of the address on the front page are far too small. It's hard to see when glancing at the cover. How big do you need it to be? Increase the letters by three font sizes. Just a minute. Let me take notes of your requirements. OK, what else needs changing? The information regarding the pool should be deleted because it is currently under renovation and is not available. So, all of the relevant descriptions on page 2 should be removed? What do we replace it with? We can't just leave the whole page blank. Just fill it in with the introduction of our newly opened gym. I've included all the relevant information here in this flash drive. Let me check. Um, I see. No problem then. What is also bothering us is that the description under the top photos on page 4 is incorrect. The word lounge needs to be replaced with reception. Fully noted. Is that all? No, there is more. Turn to page 5. We feel that showing merely the picture of our exterior and interior decoration does not fully represent the appeal of our hotel. On second thought, we've decided to use a picture with the view of the hotel. Do you have the original copy of the picture? Yes, it is also enclosed in the flash drive. OK. We'll re-edit the whole layout of the photos. Great. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Let's turn to the next page. Yes. What's wrong with that? It seems perfectly fine to me. At first sight it seems fine, but according to the feedback of the customers, the prices do not stand out. So, we want to change the print from black to red to make it pop out. OK. I've made notes of all of your requests. Is there anything else? I appreciate it. Just one final request. Could you translate the whole brochure into Spanish? We have customers worldwide, you know, especially those from Latin countries. No problem. What about other languages, like Japanese, Chinese or German? These are our most popular target languages. I have to ask the manager about the Chinese version. There's been a surging number of Chinese clients during recent years. However, we don't need German or Japanese translations, as we currently don't have many customers from those two countries. Sure. Just keep me updated. So, roughly, when could we get the revised print? We need it before the end of July. It's late June now. Roughly, it'll take three weeks to re-edit. So it will definitely be ready before the deadline. Great. To where shall we send the samples? The address is number 9 Green Drive, 
Clifton NY21300. How do you spell Clifton? C L I F F T O N. Clifton. And the telephone number? It's 9030366602. Also, if you have any further questions, you can reach me through this number. OK. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Two. You'll hear a coordinator for the annual ski and snowboard exhibition talking to the audience about some practical information for the whole event. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the annual Ski and Snowboard Exhibition held from April the 8th to 17th. I am Mary Granger, coordinator of the event this year. The 10-day event features many highlights. As a snow sports lover, I know you are looking forward to a great time here. Now... I'd like to offer you some practical information about the whole event and what to expect from it. This might be the first time coming here for some of you, so for those who are still wondering about the right accommodation, I recommend Sky Hotel. It has its own health and sports clubs, just like most of the hotels here, but I love it because of its incredibly cosy beds, which guarantees good rest after an exhausting day of exploration. If you haven't brought your own equipment, like poles, boots and skis, they are available for purchase or rent at Ski Set or Snow Rental. The exhibition this year provides a colourful look into the history of skiing and an inspiring peek into the future prospects of the sport. Apart from the fascinating photo exhibitions and the most up-to-date skiing gear like always, this year... We have added four computers which can imitate the process of skiing, ensuring the same physical activity and sensations that appear during the skiing process on downhill slopes. But I have to warn you that it might be quite time-consuming to line up for the free trial experience. Many have posed the question as to how to enter the skiing and snowboarding competition. Well, rather than filling out the back of the entrance ticket or bombarding the committee with emails, the most effective method is by checking out the exhibition newsletter delivered every month for availability. At the most beloved local event, the exhibition has also drawn attention from the press. Last year, massive media coverage was on the worrisome amount of snowfalls. In order to avoid the same predicament, several artificial skiing slopes have been built. With more participants this year, we have lowered the entrance fee, which has been widely reported to local newspapers. A bonus for our participants is the ski programme. It offers a wide variety of lessons and sessions with qualified instructors, ensuring that all ages and abilities are catered to, from the first-timers to seasoned amateurs. I strongly advise you to sign up for the programme, as it is offering an unprecedented 30% discount. That's mainly because we are cooperating with the programme organiser who promises affordable prices only for the participants of the festival this year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. The director, Andy Fisher, will be there addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students called Syria and Greg talking about some research on renewable energy. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi Greg, how did it go with the research on renewable energy? Have you found anything? Yes, but I think it's about time we exchange our findings and discuss our next move. You read my mind. Right, I'll start first. Germany is the very first country I dug into in order to find innovative means of creating clean energy because 15% of its national electricity supply comes from renewable sources. I found that apart from the traditional fossil fuel industry, there's a German firm that has initiated a project using kites to generate power. Really? I've never heard of it before. How does it work? As a substitution for traditional fossil fuels that release toxic gas into the atmosphere, the power-generating kites can function in any weather. Compared to conventional wind turbines, such kites can produce twice as much energy because the overall power density is proportional to altitude. Sounds like an efficient way of producing power. OK, now let me tell you what I have found. 
There is an American company manufacturing school buses and city buses depending solely on electricity instead of gasoline. The all-electric vehicles can save up to 20 gallons of fuel on a daily basis. This could reduce transport budgets by over $10,000 each year, not to mention maintenance savings. Wow, impressive! If only there were more of these electric vehicles around. Well, over the years, South Africa has attached great importance to clean energy. The nation encourages using propane gas, which can either be extracted from natural deposits or be produced organically. It is normally stored in gas canisters as a type of cooking gas. To reduce the number of kitchen accidents, a new type of composite gas canister made of fibre was introduced. It is much safer and less likely to explode, even when engulfed in fire. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Now, about the survey. Do you have any clues as to what kind of interviewees we should include? How about local companies doing business on clean energy products? Probably not the best choice of respondents. Remember the last time we asked corporate employees to do the questionnaire? Only about 5% of them were actually willing to participate. That wouldn't be enough then. It seems we have to drop that idea. Then maybe we can ask the professors and administrative staff here to help us. They could provide their insights and understanding on energy production. It would be ideal if they would, but I'm afraid most of them are too busy to respond to the list of questions we've prepared. I guess the students here at the university would be more suitable. You're right, and it is a much bigger sample pool too. Also, I think we should include the locals. Their opinion is key to the promotion of renewable energy here in the town. But wouldn't it be difficult to collect data? There's no way the two of us could go from door to door to interview all the residents. There's no need to worry about that. We'll make it telephone interviews. That way, we'll have enough time to get sufficient data. Good idea. What should we present in our speech? Due to lack of media coverage, the majority of people actually have a limited understanding on renewable energy. Most of them aren't able to identify various types of renewable sources. So I feel we could start by clarifying what it is and the benefit of it compared to fossil fuels. That makes sense. We could start with wind energy. For centuries, wind has been used to do work. With the help of windmills, farmers used to pump water from wells or turn large grinding stones to grind wheat or corn. The windmills today generate electricity. The only problem is that it might not be windy all the time, so it is crucial to choose the appropriate site for wind farms. Well, I think we can also include comparisons between clean energy and traditional energy resources like coal, oil and natural gas. Maybe we can look into the prospect of these conventional sources of energy. The rising cost of fossil fuels and the threat of climate change is a concern to many. Totally. These traditional resources will deplete eventually. Renewable energy currently makes up less than 2% of the world's primary energy supply, and although growing very rapidly, it is not on course to fill the fossil fuel gap. Nuclear energy is another type of energy we ought to mention. Nuclear power plants can produce dependent power constantly and release far less greenhouse gases than other traditional power plants. But most people feel that this type of energy is unsafe because radiation isn't easily dealt with, especially in nuclear waste and maintenance materials. What should we end the speech with? Have you heard about a new type of energy called hydrogen fuel? It is an infinitely renewable fuel that doesn't have detrimental environmental effects. The only problem is that it is so expensive 
that only wealthy individuals can afford it, but I think overall the benefits overshadow its high cost. I think that even though this new type of renewable energy is too expensive to use at the moment, in the long run its price will go down and become more accessible. That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. We'll hear part of a lecture about time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how, with time, we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space, or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter. A scientific unit is only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government, since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. So, 
Now, I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year. Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock, or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple concept, the slow and consistent nature of a burning wax candle. By utilising this process, our ancestors were able to keep steady track of the time. The clocks were created by engraving the length of the candle with evenly spaced markings. Each marking represented a single unit of time, and, as the wax burned down, each hour would disappear. However, the drafts and the variable quality of the wax mainly influenced the time of burning. Like oil lamps, candles were used to mark the passage of time from one event to another rather than tell the time of day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.